This is Rebecca Jernigan, your tour guide into discoveries, coming to you live on this beautiful planet Earth, from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web. Let's journey together into the realms of the known to the unknown in search of discoveries, enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Good evening, afternoon, or morning, wherever you are on this beautiful planet. You are listening and watching Journeys with Rebecca right here on Project Camelot TV, and I'm your host, Rebecca Jernigan. Good evening, everyone. We have a really fantastic show tonight. I have two guests for tonight. Dr. Barbara Mango, she is an NDE researcher or near-death experience researcher and Dr. Bob Davis and some of you may remember uh, Dr. Bob he was on I think in September of this year uh, he's the author of the book the UFO phenomenon should I believe and for tonight we're going to be focusing a lot on Dr. Barbara Mango she's an extreme researcher again uh, for the NDE research she's a board member of Life Research Institute that's co-founded by Dr. Heather and Mark Rivera uh, and I'm going to throw out some websites here please know that during the broadcast we'll be giving those website addresses out again but it's nderf.org that's the near death experience research foundation org nderf.org also out of body experience we're going to be covering that tonight and that's oberf.org and also adcrf.org lots of little numbers and letters there after death communication research foundation so again we're going to be sharing those uh, with everyone tonight now the co-researchers and founders of each of those websites that I just give you are from Dr. Jeffrey and jo Jody Long um, several of Dr. Mango's uh, articles have been published uh, on the NDERF website and also, uh, when Dr. Bob Davis was on, we talked a lot about FREE, F-R-E-E, -E, and we'll get into that a little bit. It's an Edgar Mitchell Foundation. Now, it's still under reconstruction, so at this point, we're going to see if we have an update once we get Dr. Barbara Mango and Dr. Bob Davis on. And she's also going to be serving on the sub on the committee subcommittees of the Near Death Experience there for F R E E Free, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation. So she has uh, extensively researched this. As a matter of fact, uh, when Barbara and I were introduced, actually through Bob, Dr. Bob Davis, that's who um, introduced us originally, and we had uh, hours long conversation several times, and uh, we spoke a great deal about her thesis and how she got into uh, being a researcher uh, for the near death experiences. So at this time, I'd like to welcome both Dr. Bob Davis and Dr. Barbara Mango to the show. Welcome, guys. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having us. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you again, Rebecca. Yay! It's nice to see both of you. It's really, really fun. This is a. Uh, these topics, of course, are near and dear to my heart. Uh, exploring them, uh, the way that I explore them, certainly not as a researcher or as uh, somebody that does as much involvement on on the end that you do, Barbara. And of course, Bob, I know that you have also spoken with Barbara at great lengths. Uh, and yours actually came from the book you wrote, which I found really fascinating. That after you wrote the book, uh, the UFO phenomenon, should I believe, it, it brought you to another place, which is we need to research more about what happens with the experiencers. And then, of course, you and Barbara met, and uh, as they say, there are no accidents. And uh, and here's our lovely Barbara Mango with us tonight. Um, it really is so much fun to have you here. Um, so either one of you can start, but I think we'll start with you first, Barbara, for a moment. Sure. Um, let's talk about your beginnings into all of this because I think the whole thing is really quite fascinating and I think everyone's really going to enjoy, uh, first of all, is listening to some of the information. And I'm, I, I've been remiss again. I'm going to have to stop you right there because I did it again. If anyone has any questions for tonight, they can write us in the chat room. 
they need to put their questions in all capital letters and the producer which by the way tonight is JP uh, we also have our regular producer that's also in the chat room so the JP and uh, Brad uh, Brad oh my gosh JP and Brian <laughs> That's Bob and Brad together, Brian. Who knows? Um, anyway, it's been one of those days. Brian is in there, and he will be sending us those messages in our chat room here, and so we can. I will read those questions, and you guys can answer those right on air. I'm sure there's going to be some people with a lot of questions tonight. I know that Bob, when you were on, there was a lot of questions as well. We just didn't get to them all. So I suspect with these topic. Uh, matters, um, subjects that we're going to have a, a few questions and I look forward to it. So anyway, now back to you Barbara, now that I keep getting off on these tangents. If you will, go ahead and just share with everyone kind of how you began this because you did your thesis um, on this and that was the first question I asked you when uh, when we first uh, connected up. I was like, wow, how did you get involved with this? Yeah. And and when as I was talking to you, Rebecca, I I actually my interest was piqued or my adventure started when I was about two years old. I started um, as far back as I can remember, between two and three, I started having a, a series and continuation of what you would call paranormal, spiritual, transcendent experiences. Um, my first one being as, again, probably around two years old when I met a spirit guide. It was a Native American a woman who I called Luli. I'm sure her name was much longer and beautiful, but that's all I was able to pronounce. And she and I used to have chats over my little tea tea table. I would have tea parties and put my little dolls around the table and then suddenly one day I was joined by this very tall, elegant Native American woman who introduced herself to me as Luli and I immediately knew I was in the presence of of a beautiful spiritual being and she would speak to me of course telepathically and I have a vague recollection of her giving me a download of a very, um, very intelligent, uh, intellectual, vast knowledge that at the time I absorbed and I understand, but of course now I've forgotten. And I remember running into the room, my mother um, said, you know, come on in, we're having dinner, you got to stop your tea party. And I remember being so excited, I ran into my mother, uh, into the kitchen, I said, Mom, Mom, oh my God, I was having a talk with my spirit guide during my tea party. And she told me, no, Barbara, you weren't having a talk with the spirit guide, that was your invisible friend. And I'm sure many of us have been told we have invisible <laughs> friends, but that's where, yeah, so she was my invisible friend that visited me many, 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 many times. And then one day just stopped and perhaps I I didn't need her in my life at that time anymore or she had told me all she needed to tell me. So from my very first experience as a small, small child, um, you know, just beginning to, to develop a vocabulary, I, I had this sense that, wow, um, there's something going on here that's beyond me. And this is, this is really fascinating. And the second experience I had was when I was around five years old. I shared this um, with Rebecca earlier. I grew up in the Midwest and I was raised as a um, liberal, in a liberal Jewish family. And, and this is during the uh, 60s, so of course it was imagine the Bible Belt in the 60s with a Jewish girl in the neighborhood who has these bizarre paranormal things happening to her. And fortunately, when I was uh, between five and six, I was in first grade, and I was very, very sick the whole year. I, my mother told me I missed 51 days of school, and I believe if you missed 52 days, you were held back a year. So I, I barely made it in the cutoff. And I had a consistent 
chronic case of, of just upper respiratory issues and they ended up developing into pneumonia and I was constantly being taken to the pediatrician and I, as far as I can remember he tried literally every kind of, of uh, antibiotic that was known at the time, cough medicines, antibiotics and nothing, nothing was curing this thing and it was it was really difficult um, and at, during this time period um, I had I started having a series I call them a series of, of dreams and in the first dream and I use that term loosely because at the time even though I was only five or six when I had it Rebecca I knew that it was not a dream incredibly different than a dream and I actually was aware I was having a past life experience um, during this dream and and to make a long story short in the dream I was a small child exactly the same age I was in real life I was five or six and and the dream started with me as a small child I lived in England I was very wealthy um, and I, I, it would take too long to describe here but the first dream I, I was of that age I saw myself I had a vision of where I lived and what my life was about fast forward my next dream I saw myself in in my 20s uh, and the last dream I had I was in my late 40s or early 50s and I saw myself very clearly and I knew that I had just given the diagnoses that I had lung cancer. I, I knew that in my past life I had been a heavy, heavy, heavy smoker. I was a drinker. I was just a major, major partier. And I had the feeling I had just returned back from the doctor and I knew that I had been told you have terminal lung cancer and I was seeing myself as a woman trying to cope with this trying to process it I could see myself in the dream um, just as as I'm looking at you or as I'm looking you know at a TV I could see myself perfectly clearly the clothing I was wearing the um, all the visuals and at the same time I was this woman I was feeling every emotion I was uh, looking out of her body it was a three-dimensional experience Rebecca I was watching the whole thing as if it were a television show or a documentary you know from far while at the same time I was this woman and I was looking out of her eyes I was feeling myself breathe and I was feeling her emotion simultaneously and I had a sense of of regret that I had brought this on myself that I had um, just not taking care of my health and anyway so as I had that last dream where I was trying to cope with the fact that I would be dying of a terrible death of lung cancer the next morning I woke up and I felt great I just absolutely felt great I wasn't coughing I wasn't struggling to breathe I remember running into my mom saying I feel really good today mom and she was shocked. I mean, I, I wasn't congested. My chest was clear. She took me to the doctor, the pediatrician, and he said, I've, I have no medical explanation for this. I mean, she wasn't responding. Barbara was not responding to any of the meds or penicillins we gave her. And, you know, I, I was really at a loss as to what to do for her. And, and the minute, you know, I had the dream the next day, he said she's perfectly, her lungs are clear, there's no congestion, they did an x-ray, clear. I mean, it was actually, you know, what they call a spontaneous healing, which later, you know, I will mention can happen in a near-death experience as well. So I've had many, 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 many experiences of a great variety. That one, however, uh, remains probably one of the most powerful because the visions were so vivid um, I was experiencing things that a, a five-year-old child would have um, would not have the ability to do uh, later on I was able to check the historical accuracy of my dress and of the times and of the you know the vehicles and homes and um, I was actually able to verify 
I of the things that I had um, seen in in my past life. But the point is, it stuck with me so strongly that even as a child, I, I knew that I was receiving information from from another place in time that I didn't in my everyday five-year-old or six-year-old life have the ability to to receive this sort of information so here I again I was this very strange um, introspective uh, six-year-old in the Bible Belt in Kansas um, going to synagogue who that she had the ability to tap into a consciousness that wasn't her own so that's sort of how I began my journey and um, as I've gone through life more and more and more and more and more um, experiences have happened to me so ever since I've, I've been a child I've had I've had a perspective that's very very different than most people um, and that okay so that in essence led me to study metaphysics um, I decided to go back to school for my master's degree way later in life as, as you can see <laughs> and um, uh, what led me to do this is I had been working in education and with small children and I, and I had a quite a bad fall and I, I broke my back and I was unable to go back to work for two days for two years excuse me and during this time I was in a great deal of pain and I was fairly immobile and so I had to figure out what I was going to do instead and I had always 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 wanted to go back to school my master's degree and I thought well you know what can I get it in and I I said wow I'm in a point I'm in a place where I can't be physical I can't I can't be the dynamically physical person I used to be and so maybe you know maybe in a way this is good because it's giving me a chance to do some inner work and and um, approach things differently and I thought you know maybe I can pursue this this fascination I have with metaphysics and consciousness and so I got in and I started researching different schools and, and, and alternative types of education in this field and I, I found a theology school, a very progressive theology school in Alabama, which is called AIHT, the American Institute of Holistic Theology. And they offered um, both uh, master's and um, PhD courses in metaphysics. And I was, I was like, that's it. And I applied, I got in, and I pursued both degrees in metaphysics. And that's how I began my journey back in school. And um, so now as that I went we, through my program, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was I was just going to say that's how you got on the idea of getting that thesis done. Um, absolutely, so, absolutely. So talk about that thesis. And so that while was fascinating. Sure, absolutely. So while I was in school, um, one of the courses I I took that was required was uh, near death experience studies. And that was near-death experience was actually the one experience I haven't had. I've had literally almost all other types of, of paranormal or extraordinary experiences. And I so I was really fascinated with this class. I was I was fascinated with the kiddies, with the cutting edge research. Everything about it just drew me in. And I think Rebecca, what what really hooked me was, you know, people such as I or, or many probably of, of the viewers and listeners have had, you know, experiences and 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 there are our experiences and we own them and they're unique and and um, very special to us. But if we were to explain them to someone else, they may, you know, say, yeah, you're nuts, that's crazy, that's in your mind, you're imagining it. Yet, when I was studying near death, um, what made it, it such a draw to me is that it truly is one of the most scientifically studied phenomena that, that there, there currently is. And, and um, 
so it's it's becoming more and more easy to verify some of this phenomena since probably in the last 20 to 30 years for example resuscitation science has made enormous strides so a lot of people especially cardiac arrest uh, victims that would have died in the past are being brought back to life and they're coming back and they're telling amazing tales in fact this is one of the the ways this started and 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 what makes it so fascinating is because and what brings the scientific rigor to it is that most of these patients who are, who are hospitalized while they're having cardiac arrest are hooked up to you know a variety of machines that are measuring heartbeat brain function respiration breathing um, everything and so the attending physicians See, I mean, they have the visuals in front of them as to whether this person is, in essence, dead. Have they flatlined? Is their EKG flatlined? Is their EEG flatlined? Is their respiration, etc.? And they can not only see via this very advanced equipment if the person is dead or not, and actually have that verification. And when the person comes back and and gives them these stories, they can actually say, "Whoa." according to all equipment, everything here we have, they're dead. They are actually dead, flatlined, gone. And in addition, um, at least the, the, the case studies that I presented in my paper, they've all been verified by third parties. And so when you have the verification plus the highly advanced uh, medical technology to back this up, you're finally able to say, whoa, here's the phenomena that can begin having a true a true debate uh, here whether this is actually possible or not how much um, excuse me how verifiable is this and and actually it is it is quite verifiable in in um, in five in five different areas and that's what drew it to me the fact that there's some scientific rigor and people that experience this unlike some of us who I said have gone through you know past lives or spirit guides or departed loved one visit us um, it's so easy to dismiss that this is not so easy to dismiss and this is what drew me to the study of. well I, I wanna I wanna say I know I told you the story um, I was watching a, a, a documentary on TV about a, a, a doctor back in the 1800s I believe it was and what he did was he wanted to prove that there that the consciousness went on even after a person passed over mm -hmm. so his study was as he, he he got a person that was terminally ill and said you know can I can I sit with you until you pass away and he said he could prove this um, because what happened was at the time of death he weighed this patient and after death he weighed them again and they weighed ounces less but still in in as much as that they weighed less than what they did um, when when they were still breathing and alive and so he did this repeatedly and of course he published these papers and did all of that for after-death experiences right I know this isn't exactly on the NDE but I wanted to bring that up because here was a guy that meticulously even though he didn't have high technology he had you know the ability to weigh somebody must have been pretty good in order to be able to get grams and ounces mm -hmm. out of the weight of a, of a human being at the time of their passing and he said so as soon as they passed they became lighter because the consciousness left so he believed that that's how he believed that there was life after death and so it's like the you know the near death experience they leave right but they come back to the body mm -hmm. we bring Absolutely. them back because at some point I believe that they're not severed completely from the body right at yet it's still young you know it's still close enough to the physical form um, I've had a couple of near-death experiences that I, I told you about and I, I would I find the phenomenon myself as amazing I look back on it even on my own life and I go wow this just was amazing and they were both very different from each other and uh, 
I find the whole process of this near-death experience and what people have gone through and then they come back and tell them about it and I have to tell this story about a cardiologist out of out of uh, Michigan matter of fact in the, in the town that uh, I used to work in in Michigan he's a, a, a pretty famous cardiologist and I actually interviewed him on my show I didn't know he was from Michigan come to find out he knew a bunch of people I knew it was just crazy is craziest stuff you just never know who you're gonna meet right and so from a cardiologist viewpoint he was talking about all the near-death experiences that his patients had after he brought them back and they were all uh, you know had heart attacks or uh, whatever the case may be because you know that's his line of work obviously as a cardiologist right so I find that really fascinating that goes along with what you're talking about and here's this cardiologist and he said prior to all of this when he got into uh, the whole idea of being a cardiologist and then all of a sudden his patients were starting to explain to him some of their experiences and he said for you know for quite a few years he ignored it until they became so many that he finally had to look into it himself mm -hmm. and became altogether different type of a doctor he was still a cardiologist but now he took these patients and spoke with them differently because he did the research and he learned about it and he himself believes in in that whole after death experience but yet coming back as well very fascinating it is fascinating and I know what you're talking about I think we talked about that but isn't that what the uh, the movie 21 grams was based on because I believe the amount they say that that was measured was 21 grams or something to that effect um, which is so fascinating and I agree with you the, the um, you're not completely leaving there is some tie but but what I based my paper on my actual dissertation was called um, divided minds the spiritual and scientific debate death experience because obviously um, not having a scientific or, or uh, medical background I had an experiential background my my experiences from again from the time I was two years old my experiences throughout my entire life taught me um, that consciousness that I believed that consciousness was not localized to the brain you know how could it be I, I felt that that I was receiving information in a variety of ways from something that was larger than myself and and so I, I decided to write about um, a debate that I don't know uh, how many people are aware of this but right now in in science there's there's an ongoing and very um, vigorous debate between what science and medicine like to call the um, materialist and non-materialist viewpoint of of near death experience and and basically what that that means is that science you know science is very um technical hard nosed uh, traditional as is medicine and they don't they don't do change particularly well as you know it takes a long time to bring to bring uh, cuz i i forgot it wasn't it um so you you know some of the um uh I'm, I'm blanking here, Rebecca, but the uh, the person that developed the telescope, I'm Galileo, right? Yeah. I believe he was considered a heretic back then. So, so if you have ideas outside the box, they yeah, it takes a long time for them to be accepted. And I'm like, I have got to tackle this. So the current debate that goes on are these. I will call them the traditionalists or skeptics. I like the word skeptics. So the whole the whole point is that because they can determine that people are clinically dead, the traditional medicine will look at the scans. They'll look at a brain scan. Now a brain scan, if you can imagine in your head, a, a CAT scan, when the brain is fully functioning or you're fully conscious. I mean, it's it's lit up like a Christmas tree. See. Uh, vast coloration you'll see reds and yellows and greens and oranges and and purples and and that's that's you know the brain in full action if you look at an actual brain scan of 
a deceased person, a person you know with no brain activity, is black. I mean, it's just like looking at a a, a black empty void. So traditional medicine will will look at that. They'll they'll see there's no heartbeat. They will see a flat EEG, EKG, no respiration. They'll see this the um the actual scan of the brain and all they'll see is a blackness their attitude is wait a minute there is no way this person is having a near-death experience because they're dead their brain is not working it can happen it's absolutely impossible their brain isn't working because we believe that consciousness is a part of the brain that is biologically placed it's a part of the brain Look at the brain's dead, the scan shows the brain dead, the EEG, the EKG, all of our tests are showing the brain's dead and consciousness is in the brain. So these people are coming back and they're hallucinating or they're, they have many, many reasons. They've had to come up with reasons why these people are coming back with stories because since their consciousness has ceased to exist when they died, these stories can't be real. So they've come constructed a variety of, of reasons, such as the most common is the person was hallucinating. Okay, and a lot of doctors will tell their patients, oh, you were hallucinating. Oh, you still, you know, you're still groggy from medication. Another um, one of their major arguments is that the patient hasn't been given enough anesthesia. And it's called awareness under anesthesia. And that's that's um a very uh, common argument. The problem with that argument is awareness under anesthesia is extremely, extremely, extremely rare. I think it's um, only one in 19,000 people have uh, awareness under anesthesia. And I am one of, I have had that happen to me as well. And I've had that experience and, and I can discuss a little further, but you would never, never, ever, ever, ever confuse that with a near-death experience. And another one the skeptics love, yes, they call it um, reconstructed imagination. And they use this, they all either use hallucination or reconstructed imagination or you know inadequate anesthesia interchangeably. You could take someone who had an NDE under cardiac arrest, who had an NDE who's congenitally blind, who had an NDE no matter what their circumstances will, and they, they'll use any of these arguments you know interchangeably. And what um, reconstructed imagination imagination as in essence is, is um, these days you know when a person is I've had surgery recently I don't know if any of you have but if you have and you're these days you're pretty much wheeled into the operating room you know awake you've got your IV drip in but you're awake you're conscious you're kinda of hanging out with the doctors they're talking to you they're introducing themselves to you you're looking around the room going oh oh <laughs> I'm in for a, a fun time here and um, sometimes you see the equipment they're going to use they'll discuss it with you um, the last time I had surgery I remember the the um, anesthesiologist saying hey you know hey how do you like this music do you mind if we play the radio this is you know we really like this channel I'm like cool that's fine so what they're so what they say is that people that come come back um, that have had anesthesia they'll either say well you were in you didn't have enough anesthesia ad, you know administered or you were hallucinating or you reconstructed what happened for example they would have told me should I have had one well you know you came into the room awake so you saw what the doctors looked like you saw some of the equipment they were going to use. You saw what the room looked like. So you have a pretty good overview of what was going to go on. So as you were coming back to consciousness, you sort of put the pieces together and reconstructed a story that sounds real enough. Like it, you could say, I saw this when I was out of my body. And we're saying to you, no, Barbara, you, you just put the pieces together when you, you were coming back. And um, so they have to come up, like I said, with a variety of their own reasons to to um, defend their position. And Rebecca, this is like one of my favorites because I think they some of the reasons that that scientists and and, and the medical field give are just so outrageous. And one of them was given by the late Carl Sagan. And I think 
most of us are, from, are familiar with, with people that um, study or read about near death with the tunnel, you know, the light at the end of a tunnel. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carl Sagan had this wonderful idea that what he attributed that to was uh, individuals were recalling the birth canal. They were recalling their actual birth. And what was happening is as they were coming down as little infants down the birth canal, they were seeing the light, quote, at the end of the tunnel was really the light in the delivery room. And that the doctor, who they may say, oh, I saw a figure, I saw a figure in the light, I saw a spirit guide in the light, I saw light. that was actually the, the obstetrician. And he really believed this. And I, when I read that, I was thinking, are you kidding me? First of all, a baby's head is pressed against the birth canal. Baby can't see anything. And, 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 and so imagine you being a baby coming down the birth canal and you're all comfy and you're all cozy and you're, you know, you're being forced to be, to, to be born and it's, it's very traumatic. And, and then, you know, if you're not pulled out with forceps, you're being grabbed and you're pushed. And, and one of the first things they hold you upside down and then they bring you over and stick a silver, silver nitrate in your eyes and it, it just, it would be absolute torture. And I'm reading this and going, well, first of all, that isn't physically possible, but this is stretching it a little, you know? I mean, here we're, we're grasping at straws a little bit. So my point being that, um, you know, in order to uphold this, this uh, theory, there's quite a few interesting constructs they come up with. And that, that is one of my favorites. <laughs> so that, yeah, that, that, that you know, really well, is. All right, I don't think so, Carl Sagan. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it comes from, from somebody who has obviously never had a baby. Exactly. And doesn't, and doesn't know anything about having a baby. And most men don't know what it's like to have a baby. <laughs> Not any that I've actually met have actually had a baby. <laughs> so... Yeah, um, yeah. I now um, I remember reading about that, and I I was it disturbed me, and I kind of just moved on. I, you know, when things just don't set well with me, I don't really have a tendency to dwell on them. I just move on. But I do remember that now, and I remember I thinking, yeah, yeah, have a baby, and then let's talk. I I know that's exactly what I was thinking, and I was thinking, oh my God, this is like nuts. Are you kidding me? He's such a well-respected scientist, and he's actually saying this. Okay, women are not going to like you. Um, <laughs> your, your female following is now ended. Um, but on the flip side, so, so now again we're looking at you know the flat EEG, the flat EKG, the lack of respiration, no heartbeat, and again we're looking at this brain scan that is basically just looks like you know honestly it looks like a skull that that's filled in with black crayon. So the cutting edge science and what we call the non-materials, they believe that consciousness isn't localized in the brain. The brain's a receiver of consciousness, and so they'll take the flip side and say, well, wait a minute. There is nothing going on that we can see biologically, but these people are coming back with these amazing stories that so many of them we can now verify via third party, and we actually know that they're dead via our technology, so this this is exactly what we're talking about consciousness it can't be localized to the brain because these experiences are real and they use five there's five main areas that are uh, the areas that have the most validity um, to proving that consciousness is non-local because each of these areas really if you delve into them there's no uh, they're medically inexplicable they can't really be explained medically um, for example uh, the, the main arguments then that they would they would theorize uphold their case would be um, NDEs as we said during cardiac arrest NDEs in the congenitally blind which is one of to me the most amazing um, and strongest arguments. NDEs that um, occur under anesthesia, which I briefly touched on, uh, and 
<clears throat> excuse me, and people that have uh, OBEs or out of body experiences during their near death that are verified by third party. And um, I can give you an example of, of one of that I find I find very interesting. And again, this be an example uh, of a near death experience in either somebody who's having cardiac arrest or it can be used as an example of an out of body experience because they all have overlapping features. Uh, this is this case study about a woman named Maria, and Maria was a migrant worker in California, and she came to visit a relative in Seattle. She had never ever been to Seattle before, and during her visit, she unfortunately had a heart attack. By the time the ambulance came, she was in cardiac arrest, and when you're in cardiac arrest, in all essence, that means you're dead. Um, and she was taken to the hospital where she eventually was successfully resuscitated. Um, and she told her doctor about an experience she had had while she was dead. And she was very agitated and insistent that he listened to her. And he, he just basically waved her off and said, nah, you know, you had a hallucination. You don't know what you're talking about. You're heavily medicated. Relax. Go back to sleep. However, she was assigned a critical care nurse who took her more seriously. And Maria kept, kept insisting that she had seen a men's, a male's sneaker on the third floor of the hospital. And this, this critical care worker is, is thinking to herself, this woman's crazy, but she's so insistent that I really need to listen to her. So Maria told her that um, she, while she was dead, she had floated out of her body. And she had seen the equipment. She had seen that she had a flat EEG, EKG. She came to the realization she was in care. And soon afterwards, she floated up towards the ceiling, and then she just she felt this really strong impulse to keep floating. So she floated through the second floor of the hospital. She floated up to the third floor, and while she was on the third floor, she felt very drawn to a particular unoccupied room, and she moved to the room, and she was drawn to a window in the room, and it was a, a corner room in the hospital, so she was at the, the adjoining corner. And she, she looked out the window, and she saw a man's singular sneaker. It was a left, I believe it was a left-footed sneaker. She described it as being a Converse All-Star sneaker. It was blue. The laces were undone, and the, the uh, toe was worn through. So this is a story she's telling her critical care worker. And, and again, the care worker's going, oh, gosh, oh, yeah, right, whatever. But she was... But Maria was, became very, very agitated, and she just really, really wanted her to check. So the critical care worker did go up to the third floor. She went into the room that Maria described, and she was sort of peeking out of the window, and something caught her eye. And, and she saw something on the corner of the ledge, but she couldn't quite reach it because it was actually on the corner. So she called the man over. And he was able to open the window and, you know, to take a pole or a stick and, and grab it. And it was a man's left-footed blue Converse All-Star sneaker with a little toe worn out. And she made a statement later on, and uh, she said, you know, I had been an atheist before this. I didn't believe in anything. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe that consciousness existed after life. And she said, this immediately made me believe her. So um, I think that's a really good illustration, and and so, you know, science may argue, well, you know, it's a lucky guess, she was dreaming, she was hallucinating, whatever, but how do you really explain this, Rebecca? You can't, you can't explain this. I mean, it was verified, it was very, very specific information um, that was verified, everything, including... Um, the condition of the worn out toe, the shoelaces, and there's no possible way for somebody that measures, um, in all instances, clinically dead, no brain activity whatsoever. His brain is it in, in no way, shape, or form at any level of functioning to be able to have these kinds of thoughts or memories. 
and then to prove that this actually happened, I mean, it's 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 astounding. And there's there's thousands of cases where people are coming back and telling these kinds of stories. And this is one area that really is truly medically, you know, medically inexplicable, and and really provides a lot of of um, support for the theory that no, these these cardiac arrest um, uh, you know patients are actually having an out of body experience that is real because their consciousness continues um, after death and they're having a you know a heightened awareness um, with intelligent consciousness you know here's what I would like to see and and we're getting better at it our, our technology I think eventually Barbara will catch up with us but um, the ability to measure to view if you will um, the energetic signatures that you know like the old Krillian machines where they used, you could go to those fairs yeah. and get your aura they could see mm -hmm. the different colors etc and so mm -hmm. forth so if they could get some kind of technology um, and I'm sure they already have it it's just probably just not out in the mainstream where more people know about it I'm sure this mm -hmm. is just not you know uh, just not known yet um, worldwide or certainly in too many circles um, but where they can actually view the energetics um, of people when when they're in various states whether it's a state of sleeping mm -hmm. a state of cardiac arrest uh, in in surgery uh, whatever the case may be um, where you can begin to look at these energies and you would have an actual proof Mm -hmm. If you could, if there was some kind of diagnostic machines where you could see exactly. that this is, oh look, that that's you know, and after much research and 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 you know continuity in the research, where they could pinpoint what these energy signatures are. I'm a big person into the the whole energetic signature thing because I view things um, from energy sources from you know minute minuscule things and so I know that they exist I mean I have not I have like you know a tiny bit of scientific knowledge and it's just enough to make me look stupid most of the time it's just you know so I'm you know if I can view it and I can tell people about it you know there's there has to be some existence to it and I, I'm, I'll be glad when they start making some breakthroughs what I would like for you to do uh, at this point, Barbara, because we're going to take a break here in about 12 minutes at the top of the hour, just a couple minute break. Um, let's uh, roll that into um, the uh, website, the Near Death Experience Research Foundation uh, website, which is um, which you're a, a, a member of the panel. Yes. No, the uh, Near Death. Yeah, the Near Death Experience mm -hmm. Research Foundation Enderf. Yes. Uh, I'm not, it's run by Dr. Jeffrey and Jody Long. Okay, my bad. Um, no, no, it's fine. I, I, um, I had reached out to Dr. Long while I was writing my dissertation. He and his wife um, founded, it's the world's largest research website in the world for near-death experience. And um, he started off similarly to what we discussed <laughs> before a radiation oncologist in uh, Huma, Louisiana and he was having uh, very traditional of, at the beginning of his career and he was having patients come back and tell him these stories and thankfully Dr. Long is a very very wonderful warm-hearted and open-minded person and he was fascinated with the stories so he um, over time he developed a website with his wife to to actually get more information and converse with um, experiencers. So his website currently has over 4,000 cases that he and his wife has collected. He has his website is is available in 27 languages. So he has he's collected uh, stories from all over the world, and. Unlike a lot of websites, this isn't like some automated, and he actually has live translators that that uh, volunteer for him. And um, 
so he, these stories are across culture, across the world, um, and yet they're also consistent. So if there's any website that viewers are really interested in getting a, just a vast amount of information, general information, specific information, resources, if you've had a near-death experience or anybody that you know have had a near-death experience and they would like to share it anonymously, he has an ongoing um, ongoing research and you fill out a questionnaire. Again, it's, it's anonymous. And um, I, again, I was, I was uh, very happy that he responded to my email when I was still getting my doctorate. He asked to send a sample of my writing. When I was finished, I did. He liked it. He asked me to write several articles for his website since he is published. So again, if, if you were wanted to learn something about, say, out-of-body experiences or um, non-local consciousness or near-death experiences during anesthesia, my name would pop up and you could read my article. And it's also, Rebecca, a wonderful, wonderful resource for people that um, you know, don't necessarily feel comfortable forward and discussing their experience because it's it's very difficult for most people. Um, he has a, a a chat room and all different forums for discussion, um, and and you can talk confidentially. And it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful site for information. Again, if you're an experience or know an experience or want to share your experience um, or participate in a research study, uh, it's, it's a great, great resource. So I have written and published for him. I am not a part, per se, of the foundation. But they're wonderful, wonderful, lovely people. I can't speak highly enough of them. Well, and so, you know, when, when uh, Bob was on with me, um, we, we talked a lot about the fact that there wasn't a lot of support groups out there. Uh, for the experiencers, no matter what the experience is, whether no. uh, you're a contactee, whether you're an abductee, whether you have an OBE or an NDE, or even either a, a, an after-death communication with a loved one or somebody that you knew or knew of or whatever yeah. the case may be, um, y y we needed this, you know, 25 years ago. Um, because that's when a lot of people started coming forward and the whole world just kind of went crazy with with all of the people coming forward and uh, you know there was a lot of campaign against you know people like you and me Barbara I <laughs> seriously know, I know, <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I, I know I hate to admit it I really do but you know oh my gosh there's the freak right oh well you know hey it's okay now I don't care. You know, then I did, but now I don't. You know, it's like, hey, yeah, I've certainly been called worse. So it's all good. But, you know, these websites, um, and we're going to give them out again here when we come back yeah. after the top of the hour. Well, uh, we'll give them out a couple times. And I think what I'm going to do is I, um, on my uh, broadcast page on my website, mm -hmm. I've left a couple of um, things up uh, for past shows uh, just for information for people. I think I will... Mm -hmm copy and paste all of this into the broadcast page so when people go down and they look at w the, after the live broadcast there's going to be mm -hmm. some information there for people um, that they can go in and look at uh, these websites so so that if they don't have a pencil and paper or they're, they uh, can't watch this again or listen to it again they right. can at least go there and, and get the information because I think it's so very important that we support each other um, uh, whether you believe or not whether you've had an experience or not um, et cetera and so forth I still think that we need to support each other in the experiences that we've had even whether or not we understand them or not what makes it also nice is the people that uh, may not like your mother said oh it's just your invisible friend that's what my mother called it was my imaginary friend when I told her about mine and so I had an imaginary friend all my life you know and um, and it would have been nice to know as I got older and I was able to articulate that, that I could begin to share that in some way with uh, somebody that would at least listen and not, not mm -hmm. you know, blow it off. Or, and it's, you know, bless their hearts, they didn't understand. If they've never experienced anything like that, they, they wouldn't know what to say to you. Whereas all these people on these sites, 
they either know about it or they themselves have had the experiences and that's what makes it so wonderful for support. Absolutely Rebecca, I, I totally agree with you. I think um, you know even though times have changed it, it's still a hard thing to talk about especially when you feel that you're, you're not going to be heard or that you, you know you're not going to be understood. It, 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 it's, um, it's difficult um, for all of us, you know, in, you know, whatever experience that we've had, and and um, especially for near-death experiencers, because I and I, again, I can get into this a little more later, but um, it, it's a very difficult when people come back from a near-death experience. It's 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 a very difficult process of sort of reintegrating what you've what you've experienced on the other side with who you are. It it it's um, it, it eventually is a wonderful, positive, glorious uh, experience, but in the interim, it takes about four to seven years to process it, and 40% of, of all near-death experiencers develop PTSD, and a great deal of that it, it, may be not caused by it, but I think um, it exacerbates it that, that they don't have support. It, it, it's, it's, it's just very, it, it's, 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 it's just a shame, it's unacceptable, it's, it saddens me that these people that are actually brave enough to tell their doctor, they're, they're just, they want to share this and, and they're told, you had a hallucination, you're crazy, it, it didn't happen. And so how do you handle this, this, this enormous event when you're told that you're nuts or you imagined it or you had too many drugs? Um, and that's just again for near death. I agree with you. It's much larger than that. It's it's for any of us who have experienced any type of a phenomena, and and to find a supportive group is so important. I wish I wish there was a broader base for that. I would like somehow to see that developed. Um, you know, however, maybe that could going forward um, for more people to access. Um, I don't know how that can be done, but you know what I mean. Like just, I, just I do. a broader audience. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, before we um, break at the top of the hour, let's bring Bob back. We haven't heard from Bob. Bob, are you still with us, dear? We'll give you time to unmute and there yeah. you are. Hi, sweetie. Hi, hi. And uh, I wanted to bring you back in for a minute before we left, just as um, uh, an update or a, as a, a piece of information that you were the first one that talked to me about free. Um, I first heard about it from you, uh, that particular website, uh, just, and I, I, I've been to that and I've been to the ones that Barbara's links that, you know, I've also was repeated at the beginning of the show here. And, um, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm absolutely pleased as punch with the work that was being done, um, do you have any updates on free? Does it? Do we know if it's back online? If it's coming back online? Yes, uh, the website is under construction. It's experiencer.org, and free is an acronym for the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters. Uh, it was uh, founded by uh, uh, Ray Hernandez, uh, and there are many physicists, psychologists. Um, uh, among other, from the medical, the scientific, and non-scientific community as members uh, of that. We're in the process of, of gathering data from thousands of experiencers with so-called ET contact, and we're analyzing their results from quantitative surveys, and now we're beginning the qualitative phase of the study. And uh, no firm conclusions, although the preliminary data are extraordinary. And we'll, presenting the, we'll be presenting the results at various uh, conferences in the upcoming year and certainly on, on broadcasts. So hopefully, uh, uh, we'll invite um, me or other members of the <laughs> to share the results uh, uh, at a point in time. Uh, and I'll Absolutely. let you know when we're ready to do so. It'll be fairly soon. But I think your audience will be very uh, intrigued by the, by the conclusions uh, drawn from the study. Absolutely. Um, Got about a minute left, and we're going to go to break. And then when we come back, we'll we'll let you chat some more about that. Um, the um, uh, the the studies that are being uh, conducted. By the way, um, I was contacted. I, I went on to the website and I took the um, 
series of questions I was sent a second survey um, and there's more to talk about with this but what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, take our break um, our uh, producer JP is going to be putting up uh, some kind of a um, something for people to look at and he's also going to be playing a piece of original music for us we'll, have, we'll be back in about four minutes or so so please everyone out there stay with us we'll be back with more of Dar Dr. Barbara Mangle oh wow and Dr. Robert Davis right after this break <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not working either. So I don't know what the heck's going on there. Um, seems to be playing a, a, a terrible song. Um, uh, very uh, great I apologies. Um, I can come back. Rebecca, would you would you uh, yeah take back the, uh, the command? I'll step back. All right, everyone, welcome back. We're going to wait for uh, Dr. Barbara Mango to return, as well as Dr. Bob Davis and uh, JP. You do still have your no, you don't. Okay, your mic is off. Um, and I want to give a few announcements while we're waiting for everyone to return here. Uh, is that I, I'm having a uh, interestingly enough, I it didn't I didn't actually plan it this way, but uh, this coming Sunday is my past life timeline integration class. Uh, it's for uh, students who want to explore the whole idea behind past lives. Um, I have a very few openings left at this point I think I have three openings uh, left is all for this Sunday's class and the cutoff on that will be Saturday um, which that date will be the 12th if I'm not mistaken yes it's the 12th and uh, so if you want to register you go to my website that's journeyswithrebecca.com and then just look up the classes while you're there please check out my new book The Great Revealing it's available for sale and that's in the book section on my website uh, that just became available on December 1st so uh, I would entice you all to go and check that book out uh, it's part one of a trilogy there will be two more books coming after that hopefully I will have another one prepared in the next few months in 2016 so looking forward to that um, and there's uh, also the updated guest list uh, for the rest of the shows for this year, 
Uh, there will be two dates that I won't be doing shows. And that is my regular shows, and it's the last two Tuesdays in December. So you can get all that information on my website. You can also sign up for my free newsletter, and you can do that right from the front page of my website. Okay, I think I've got all the announcements out. Um, the other thing I wanted to remind people that if you have a question, please do uh, write those questions in the chat box. Put them in all caps and forward them to us. Um, I'm sorry, they will be forwarded to us. Boy, am I having some issues today. Um, <laughs> they will be forward to, forwarded to us, and we will be answering those right on the air if I can remember how to read and speak at the same time. We'll figure it out, folks. Okay, so that being said, I want to welcome back both Barbara and Bob. Um, thank you both, again, for, for being here and sharing uh, your time and your energy and your knowledge with us and uh, all the hard work that you both have done uh, through the years and, and presenting your own unique information. So I thank you both for being here. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And and I think the last time we did it, something happened and we couldn't do it. It was supposed to be in November um, mm -hmm. and something came up and all kinds of technical issues or something. And there's been so many issues last month, I can't keep track of which one was which. It's like I feel like, you know, what day was that? I don't remember. <laughs> but we're going to get through it. I'm hoping that 2016 is a little smoother ride, at least technologically speaking. It would be lovely. It would be a lovely change for sure. All right. So, uh, Bob, I interrupted you um, at the last, so if you will, maybe pick up some more of your information, then we'll get back to Barbara. I'd like to open it up for uh, more discussions here uh, on all of it, on the NDEs, the after-death communication, the OBEs, uh, lots of people out there. I can tell you in my audience uh, that there's lots of people that have had these experiences, so we definitely want to make sure we cover those websites again. Uh, for people so that they can really, really know where to go for additional information. So, Bob, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to you uh, for a few minutes. And if you will, lean forward cause, so we can hear you a little better. Uh, sometimes your speakers aren't real loud. I think you have a very soft voice, though. <laughs> I do. I do. You know, the, the more I get involved in, in studying all, all aspects of the paranormal, you know, parapsychology, uh, which in, incorporates uh, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, uh, unidentified flying objects, telepathy, precognition, apparitions, you, you, you name it. We can go, we can go down the list, uh, and it's a long one. Uh, but the, the, the critical question is, is there some type of uh, all-encompassing theory that may possibly tie all uh, or most uh, of these so-called anomalous things that are not easily explainable by the scientific community, so to speak, things that seem to defy a logical explanation that's not consistent with current scientific principles, can it all possibly be related to something, some again, all-encompassing principle. And there are many theoretical physicists, among other scientists from, from a variety of different disciplines, that try to advance ideas that might possibly help to explain uh, what is going on. Um, and by the way, I did greatly uh, enjoy both of your insightful, uh, well-informed uh, discussion in the first hour because you raise many important issues that relate to what I'm, I'm getting at. And what I am getting at here is is something you brought up, non-locality. Um, Dr. Mango brought it up, uh, Rebecca, you, you too in various ways, um, meaning is there a, a dualistic nature uh, of the body? Is, in other words, consciousness distinctly different than the brain? Uh, is it a separate entity that possibly continues or persists after the death of the body? It, it, does this relate to the out-of-body or near-death experience? And and what quantum theory of uh, physicists will contend is that subatomic particles like photons and electrons also behave in a dualistic manner. 
in the sense that they can behave like a particle or a wave. And to be very brief, to, in order to make this analogy for an all-encompassing possible theory, is that if you take a subatomic particle, separate it, and make them uh, um, exist you know, light years apart from one another, and manipulate one in a clockwise spin, the other separated particle, once joined, but now not joined, will will what? Rotate in an opposite direction, even though they appear to be in, invisible. There's no link, in other words, between them, yet they still communicate. Well, keep that in mind. The other related experiment is that if you shoot a subatomic particle into a box with two openings, it will go through one or the other opening. If somebody is watching the subatomic particle, it will behave like a particle and enter one or the other opening. But if you're not observing it, it will then act like a wave and enter both openings. The point is, the point is, there is an observer effect. There is an actual effect by our consciousness on some aspect of physical reality. We, in other words, alter, can alter reality. And this has been proven. This is not a debate. And Einstein considered this to be spooky action at a distance. There are other examples. Now, if you take these examples at the subatomic uh, world, uh, which we are obviously composed of, what are we made of? Well, we're made of these photons and electrons, among other tiny, tiny particles. But the point is, uh, does dualism at that level correspond to dualism in the human form? Uh, in other words, can our consciousness, in, in a sense, uh, behave in a similar non-local-like fashion? Well, you take telepathy. That's non-local. That's that's mind-to-mind uh, -mind communication uh, in the absence of distance. You take precognition. Uh, that's that's uh, the awareness of events either in the future or possibly in the past. Um, uh, that is non-local. In other words, it's not happening at the present time. It, 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 it's not doesn't coexist with our current space-time continuum. And and people do have uh, impressions of things that have happened in the past. And, and Dr. Mango, I think, can mm -hmm. yes, as well as you, Rebecca. Likewise, in the future. Uh, the question here again is: Is there a continuity of Consciousness. Are we dualistic in nature, like subatomic particles, which we are obviously again composed of? Take this one step further. There's something called a Global Consciousness Project out of Princeton University. Hundreds of computers are situated throughout the world as we speak, and they they generate random numbers of zeros and ones, and thousands and thousands of trials. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, over many, many, many years, you're going to get zeros and ones being produced at a ratio of 50 to 50. Right? 50% 50 zeros, 50% 50 ones. And all of the, the input from all of these computers are fed into uh, an aggregate computer at Princeton University. Well, guess what? Four hours before September 11th, the computers went highly non-random to the point where they deviated statistically significant from 50-50 to 1 to 35, which is a highly, highly significant deviation from randomness as expected. The same type of, uh, shall we say, collective consciousness effect where millions of people are focusing in on a single uh, extraordinary event simultaneously 
the same thing occurred during the Al Qaeda attacks in Spain and in London, the tsunami uh, incident in Indonesia when Obama became elected, among other uh, similar incidents where, again, collectively, millions of individuals are focusing their their consciousness on the same event. And, and for some reason, these computers pick up uh, this effect and begin to behave in a significant non-random fashion. Now, what is this proved? Well, there are different twists on it, like there are different twists on NDEs and OBEs, being it a real event where con the consciousness exists outside of the body when the body ceases to function, or it is a purely neurophysiologic event that will eventually be explainable. Uh, remains to be seen. But the point is, I'm trying to draw, I'm trying to con connect the dots between the subatomic world, consciousness studies, information, very insightful information you both are providing as, as, as in an attempt to, to try to provide a, a, a foundation for an all-encompassing theory, again, that might tie in uh, or explain, possibly, all these uh, phenomena that we continue to debate and are intrigued by and do not have any irrefutable uh, conclusive evidence in order to better understand or explain. So um, uh, I, I, I don't know if we'll ever have an answer, but right now I'm in the process of writing a book on life after death. and cannot help but get into this subject matter as a basis to say maybe maybe there is life after death if, if the quantum world exists and 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 uh, you know the, the, the subatomic particles somehow uh, continue in a quantum form uh, that provide consciousness uh, after the body ceases to function well, I will tell you is that, you know, um, the science behind uh, everything that we're talking about tonight certainly doesn't, um, it, it doesn't, um, what's the word I want to use? Um, it, it, it doesn't support all the experiences that people have. Uh, when you're talking about an experiencer, just like we were, I, I was saying earlier, uh, it could be somebody that's a contactee, somebody that's had a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience or an after-death communication with a loved one, spirit guide, whatever the case may be. Um, the science does not back it up. So I I used to ask people when 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 they would come to me and they would say, well, how can you prove? what you're saying. Well, how can you disprove what I'm saying? They can't. And I, I can tell you through many years of self-doubt, self-questioning, internal dialoguing and work and um, just really getting down into some real nitty-gritty to figure out if my experiences and who I was was real or not real by not having by the way anybody to talk to about such things uh, certainly it wasn't something that was talked about at a dinner table or talked about in uh, you know on TV or on radio or in the newspapers or anything like that people just didn't speak about things like that that you didn't you know I was the fruitcake of the family you know I was a strange one and every once in a while I would say something like when I was in school especially when I was in high school people would look at me and, and they would just walk away. I would freak people out, you know, from this. I mean, you know, my experiences are real. They're just real to me. And, and they have to be real because of, of what happens during these experiences. This is not me just checking out and being in some la-la land, you know. And there's too many other people that are having it. And again, just as we were talking with Barbara, uh, earlier, I, I just cannot wait until the day where they can come up with some kind of technological measuring device, some kind of apparatus that will be able to show 
just like they did with those photons that you were talking about. By the way, I saw that same movie or video or whatever it was. I saw that same one you were talking about. And I was just mesmerized by it because I've always been told by my guides that this, the physics of this planet is that we live in duality. And that duality is the law of the physics of our existence. And that existence doesn't include just what we think of as, you know, our body and four walls. And it goes beyond that. The air that we breathe, we can't see it, but it's there. The love that we feel is an emotion. We can't see that, but we feel it. We know it's real. So it's all of these things, and I can't wait until they can get some kind of devices built, some kind of machines, diagnostic tools, but they have to think outside of the box because we're talking about quantum. Yeah, they yeah, have to well. think very, where we're talking well. about quantum. Very Absolutely. Well, Rebecca. And and I don't know what day that will be when we do have some way of uh, objectively uh, measuring in a tangible way exactly what you're what you're getting at, and that's why we we often look to the great minds like Stephen Hawking and, and Brian Greene, um, Nikhil Cox, who are some of the, the leading theoretical physicists. Not that they have the answers, you know, not that they have all the answers it's because they're brainiacs, but. <laughs> but math, math backs it up, but they don't have that machine that you want to provide that hard, hard evidence, uh, that irrefutable confirmation. But you know they get into theories like the multiverse and coexisting parallel dimensions. You've had guests on talking about this uh, yeah. that allows for alternate realities and separate entities, beings of. Uh, that coexist in the parallel dimension with ours, uh, branching parallel universes. You know, what if you go back in time and you, and, and you kill your grandfather before your father was born? And, you know, the, the, they, 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 they hang out at the bar and debate these kinds of uh, incidents and events, and they all have answers to <laughs> alternate uh, explanations when these things happen. But the point, the point is, um, there is something profound going on that unfortunately cannot be adequately addressed by the scientific community. And not that we need the scientific community to, to, to you know, address it. It would be nice to have their blessing, but they regard all this as pseudoscience. Why? Because they don't have the ability to come up with the answer. And right. their bias, you know, which is unfortunate. Um, doesn't mean it's not real and it's not the truth, uh, but we'd like we'd like that confirmation. But it's real to those who experience it, like you and like Dr. Mango, among many other millions of individuals in varying ways, with all different kinds of uh, phenomena. NDEs being one of many, which are possibly all interrelated, based on what you said, the dualism. Right. Um, um, maybe we could bring Dr. Mango yep. back and and continue our discussion with about NDEs. I found her discussion fascinating. Absolutely. Um, and um, JP, can you open up uh, Dr. Mango's mic, please, Barbara's mic, and uh, put her video back on for us? There you are. I can see you, and we're waiting for you to be unmuted. Okay. Okay. All right, Dr. Mango, I know you can hear me. Um, let's see here. We're just waiting for the producer to go ahead and unmute the mics. Okay, let's see. It says I can't unmute it. I can't unmute her mic. Barbara, can you unmute yourself? At the top of the screen, you'll see your uh, microphone. Hit that. It won't let you unmute. Okay. Can you unmute?
No, I know that. Uh, JP, can you unmute her? Can you try, please? Uh, what we may have to have you do, uh, Barbara, is the link that's up here, the one that you got from your email. Okay, we may have you uh, just go ahead and dis disconnect from here and then just come right back in and you should be unmuted. Okay? But if I may, in the meantime, if I may, it's very difficult for to to try to develop a, a, a scientific explanation why people who have an NDE uh, have such uniquely similar experiences besides the tunnel and the light and seeing deceased relatives and spiritual beings, uh, beautiful landscapes and, and becoming uh, positively changed following the unique event of, for the rest of their lives. It's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to again provide an explanation that's neurophysiologic in nature. And yet a lot of, a lot of medical physicians and, and researchers in general try to do just that, uh, and, and unsuccessfully, thus far at least. So they'll, they'll pr come up with experiments where they stimulate a part of the brain that, that tends to create a dissociation or a floating sensation. And they'll say, see, that, see, we can induce an out-of-body experience or near-death experience by stimulating a certain aspect of the brain resulting in a similar experience. It, it may, in other words, create a, a, a minor aspect of that NDE, but it doesn't account for all the unique complexity uh, of the, the entire experience that people report. And, and we're not talking just about people who have uh, cardiac arrest, who have a flat EEG, uh, uh, we're also talking about uh, children who also go through an NDE, as well as people who actually do not or are not near death who have this similar type of experiences, as well as out of body experiences that have nothing to do with with the um, death a death or dying process. Um, yet. Yet many uh, scientists will say, well, this is a, a hypnagogic kind of ex, uh, a state of mind whereby people get the sensations of floating or being out of their body upon going to sleep. Well, that might be the case, but again, it doesn't account for that complex, um, highly unusual NDE-like event that's very similar among millions worldwide. Uh, so, it's difficult to, to understand and explain, yet um, an anesthesiologist and, and physician, Penrose and, and Hammerhoff from the University of Arizona, contend that there are microtubules and neurons in the brain that, that operate uh, on the basis of quantum physics that allow, allow for information storage in a holographic way. Well, this is highly theoretical. It probably makes no sense. <laughs> it's hard to make sense to me, but but the point is, uh, they contend that our bodies behave like quantum information storage devices. We're talking about the smallest entities of information when we talk about quanta, and and it behaves in a holographic way whereby it doesn't behave as a three-dimensional uh, construct um, in terms of height, width, and depth, but way beyond that, and that it persists after the body dies. Uh, it, it, it operates, in other words, on a different space-time continuum that's not consistent with our 3D world, but in a holographic world. And since our neurons of the brain are composed of it, they contend that they operate in a different space-time after the body dies. Well, I know. Prove it. Let's have that 
mechanical device that can provide that that object with tangible evidence to to prove just that. Yet, yet many people do believe it, while there are obviously those who are highly critical of their theories. But it is consistent. Their theories are consistent with many theoretical physicists who ascribe to quantum mechanics and the implications that that world of subatomic particle behavior uh, operates under. That spooky action at a distance, that, that highly controversial theoretical branch of physics known as quantum mechanics that may very well, may very well hold the, the foundation uh, and, and related answers to the phenomena that we are talking about. And that, of course, remains to be seen. But, but uh, it's researchers like uh, Dr. Mango uh, and many others in the field. And she studied with uh, uh, Dr. Von Lommel, a leading researcher in near-death experience. And uh, he's, he's a firm belief that NDEs are, in fact, real. Um, Bruce Grayson, a noted psychologist, psychiatrist, too, uh, contends that it is real. Even Alexander, one of the leading uh, neurosurgeons who wrote uh, a textbook on neurosurgery, it's a hallmark, landmark book that all neurosurgeons study, he had an NDE and he wrote a book about his own personal experience, firmly committed to the belief that, that we live after we die. His, his experience was so uniquely real more real I, uh, than the hand in front of your face. Uh, um, in, in ways that he expressed beautifully in his book, and I can't recall the name of it. Uh, I have it in my bookcase here, and uh, I enjoyed it very, very much. And I would uh, encourage your audience to consider reading that book by Dr. Eben Alexander. Um, so we have many people who have these kinds of unique experiences, yet it is still very debatable um, as to whether or not it's real. And, and as far as I'm concerned, for whatever it's worth, I'll, I'll take an agnostic approach and say I believe it, and I, and I don't believe it. I don't know what to believe. I just know that something profound is going on that eventually we'll have the answers to. But like you said, Rebecca, so wisely, uh, we know that, that love is real, yet measure it for me. Provide that objective, tangible evidence, get some kind of scientific uh, instrumentation that can prove it, and we can't. We can't. Not, and we don't have to have something measurable, objectively determined, um, in order for it to be real. We know love exists. We know hate exists. But, but again, quantify it. You can't. You can't. And, and, it, and, and these phenomena, too, are abstract as these emotions may be as well. So um, it, it, it's almost like a spiritual question. It can't be put to science to answer, like life after death. Am yeah. I back? You are. Welcome back, Dr. Mango. We've been, we've been chatting in the background in case everybody didn't know. And thank you so much. Um, uh, Bob, for um, wow, I, your your dialoguing is so fabulous, uh, uh, Bob, uh, and was giving you lots of kudos, uh, Barbara, in case because you didn't hear it, but you'll get to hear it in the playback. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was too busy having an out of body experience. <laughs> <laughs> my computer, my computer just would not cooperate with me. Technology, you gotta love it, you gotta hate it. It's you know, it can it go just either is way. What it is, right? Yeah, that's right. It's what it is. So, Bob, you you had some things that you wanted to uh, direct to Barbara. Uh, you were talking about so when she come back, uh, could open up the discussion uh, about it. So, would you like to go ahead and and do that? Um. um. Oh, well, I just wanted to say that, uh, 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 Dr. Mango, I, I greatly enjoyed your, your discussion about um, your perspectives of, of NDEs and, and the way you 
presented the information is in, in such a lucid and, and knowledgeable way. Uh, but what you were getting at regarding non-locality and, and the dualistic nature of consciousness and the mind, you know, my, my point that I was making um, was that it's consistent with non-locality at the subatomic level, and I think you acknowledge that. Um, and you experience non-locality yourself, have you not? You've had some very unique experiences that go beyond, so to speak, the space-time continuum that we all ascribe to in our 3D world. I don't know if you want to elaborate a, a little bit about, about those experiences you've had? Sure. Um, absolutely. Um, can everybody see me and yep. hear me? We can. Okay, good. Um, yes, Bob, I've, I've had a lot, but what I would like to back up and share, um, I, don't, I don't remember, Rebecca, if I did mention this to you, but it's, it's, it's very, um, to me, synchronistic how Bob and I met. We did meet via, um, for, and when I was asked, to come on board to work on the near-death subcommittee, um, it, nobody had known because I had not mentioned it that I had had a um, a contact myself with the UFO when I was around 12, and um, that that is an experience that I would like to share because that is a commonality that that we share in working for this organization going forward. Um, that was a, a really big, like you said, Bob, in other dimensions and all that. Um, I'll try to explain this in, in a coherent way because I was a child when this happened and it was like a, a, a big wow for me. Um, because going back to all the things I experienced, you know, the weird, wacky Jewish child in the Bible Belt in Kansas and always being kind of crazy, um, when I was... Um, 12, I, I wasn't 12, I, I, I always was 12, but I, I actually was 10. Um, I was outside in my yard in uh, Kansas City, where I grew up, the suburb, and it was a beautiful, beautiful day. I remember it being a um, very abnormally warm spring day. So my father and I and, and several of the neighbors uh, were outside doing our early spring cleanup, and um, all of a sudden, it was a, a cloudless day, cloudless day, probably around noon, and, and all of a sudden, I, I, I noticed that it was extremely dark. I mean, it just, out of the blue, went from a beautiful, full, bright sun to, to almost complete darkness, and I hadn't heard anything, I hadn't seen anything, and I looked up to see what was a, a cloud or what was blocking the sun, and it was an absolute, 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 enormous, enormous craft. It was a UFO. And um, I, I can't, I, you know, I try to describe it the best I can. I, it could have been, it could have been five football fields in circumference. It could have been a mile. I, it was just absolutely enormous. And I, I did mention this to Bob. I, I had um, a telepathic communication with, with the craft. And um, they were telling me not to be afraid, to feel no fear, that they were here in peace um, to explore. And they let me know that just as we were going to be landing on the moon, which hadn't happened yet, I was 10 and I believe the landing occurred when I was like 14. So this wasn't even something that happened. So they had told me that just as we were going to land on the moon and explore the moon and learn about it without harming it, that's what they were doing with us. And I was just memorized, mesmerized, and I lost all fear, no fear whatsoever, because I really felt safe. I knew they were having an honest, open dialogue with me, and I fully understood everything they said, and I just stared and stared and stared. I never took my eyes off the craft, not for one second, and neither did my father, you know, the non-believer, my father, and then it was it was there and it was gone. There was no movement, there was no acceleration, there was no noise. So I thought to myself, wow, 
that craft traveled faster than the speed of light. And as a 10 year old, I knew that wasn't possible. Um, I fully believed what I had seen and it made sense to me because like you said Bob I've, I've had so many experiences that it made sense to me that that we are not our planet our, our solar system our universe why why should it be the one why isn't it a multi-dimensional universe um, and and it that's the only thing that made sense that that we're all connected somehow through time and space so it made perfect sense for me to see it i wasn't fearful they reassured me and so when i came on board to free i had never mentioned that to anyone or or to bob and i found that so synchronistic so bob yes i've had several others but you know what I said to myself after that had that experience? I said to myself as a child, this weird, weird, strange child, I said, you know, I've had the experience of those past lives, so I've had in the past, I've had um, dreams or experiences that have come to fruition in the future. Uh, I mean, it, you know, in the future. So I said, wow, this is a future. So I've had the past, the present, the future, and then interdimensional. And I was, I was mesmerized, but it made sense to me. It's always made sense to me. Always, always, always. And so that's sort of where Bob and I have connected on that. And um, the, the past lives, was very powerful for me. This was very powerful for me. Um, I've had many other experiences, like I'm sure many of our our audience perhaps have had. I've had um, two very dear grandmothers I loved very much die, and um, I've had them appear to me. Um, one of them in a more dramatic form. I uh, my paternal grandmother died on my birthday which uh, was a little eerie for me at the time I was 13 so my 13th birthday my grandmother dies on my birthday and I was still living in Kansas City my grandmother lived in New York and I begged my parents begged and begged and begged them please 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 take me to New York to the funeral I need to have closure I want to say goodbye to grandma and they're like no 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 you need to stay in school you're not coming too bad whatever I was furious, I was upset, I was I was very sad. So let's fast forward six months. My birthday was in January, so it was the you know middle of the winter. Fast forward six months into um like June or July. Hot Kansas day in the summer. Uh central air was going so the windows were not open. There was no breeze. Um and my parents cranked it up pretty high so even though it was central air I'd have to say it was little toasty and I remember I had just gotten into bed and I was thinking about my grandmother and I was feeling so guilty and so upset and so distressed that I had not been able to say goodbye to her and literally momentarily as I thought that and I know this is like one of these paranormal ghost hunter shows because it you know sounds a little crazy but the temperature in the room right around my head dropped dramatically like maybe 20 30 degrees and simultaneous to that I felt the sheet uh, my sheets being tugged off of me I mean I was holding on to my sheets and and I felt this strong tug and they were being tug 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 at that point I closed my eyes tightly and I'm like oh I don't want to see what's going on right now I'm too scared and so the temperature dramatically dropped sheets were tugged down to my feet and I have to say I was pretty terrified and I tightly and then I heard my grandmother speak telepathically to me and she said Barbara yes the room dropped the temperature dropped yes I tugged your sheets because I'm trying to get your attention and I want you to know to stop feeling guilty I know why you couldn't come to my funeral I love you I'm happy where I am I'm not in your dimension anymore but we, you know, I am talking to you. I am really here. I am really talking to you. And please, please, please know I'm okay and don't feel guilty. The room immediately got warmer, and 
and and that ended and from that second on I was able to let go of guilt I had carried with me on a lot of tears cried a lot of guilt carried for the last six months and and Rebecca and, and Bob and um, others may may understand this as well but when you have contact with with a departed loved one or a spirit like like Rebecca you say you just know you absolutely know however I also knew because I was filled with a love that is so in, that's so intense that is um, is something that we as humans in our everyday five sensory way of being can't experience it's it's a profound love it's it's um it's almost describable and it's what near death experiencers describe as the light the the intense love the being of light the god and that's what i experienced and i've had many 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 bob and 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 rebecca as i'm sure i know rebecca you have too but you're right, Bob. They all, every single one of the experiences have showed me that I am either communicating with, receiving information from, or getting knowledge that that is not from my five senses or my waking consciousness. It's coming from either what you may call higher consciousness or what I've always called a non-local consciousness, something that's not of me. And that is the best I can describe it. So even though, yes, I do focus on your death and especially the uh, the current arguments or you know discussions that the two opposing theorists have, it's it's much bigger than just near death. It, it's it's all types of paranormal mediumship, um, out of body after death communication, everything we've talked about. It's it's all integrally tied. Bob, you did a wonderful job. Thank you of, of describing in a way that I'm not well versed in. Um, but but yes, it's 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 all tied, all tied to non-local consciousness and a continuation of consciousness after death, or you know, in a state where just not aware of in everyday life. Well, you know, it's very interesting, uh, Barbara, because people who that have encounters with uh, UFOs and, and reported uh, entities or non-human intelligences do contend that they communicate with them in a telepathic manner. Mm -hmm. uh, time and space um, uh, seem to come at a standstill. They, they feel as if it's a different type of time and space. It doesn't adhere to, again, our 3D uh, state of reality, whatever that might be. It's hard to put words on, to, on that, of course. Mm -hmm. But when they get into this, like you have, like Rebecca has, uh, things don't ascribe to the normal state of, of, of what we come to know. Uh, so, here again, what are people experiencing when they see UFOs and they claim to have contact with non-human intelligences? Uh, the paranormal or the tele telepathic communication uh, and other associated phenomena uh, that's consistent with those types of experiences come to bear. And, and here again, we have we have the need, I think, to try to figure out what is that all-encompassing theory that may tie all of this together, because I believe certainly what you're saying, quite literally, and, and you're not alone. There are, there are thousands, if not millions of people like you having similar types and different types of experiences that defy logical explanation. Mm -hmm. Not that there is, that there uh, will be an explanation. Eventually there will be. But but the point is, that it is real. And and um, people need support because they feel that they're alone and different. Uh -huh. uh, and may feel insecure, fearful, etc. as a result. And that's, that shouldn't be the case. And, and, and we need support from the groups that provided to you, the, 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 uh, the organizations you, you uh, belong to. And if you don't mind, maybe you can share more about the websites and, and the support 
community that they provide to their services. Um, absolutely, Bob. Thank you for that. And that's just ex you, you must be reading my mind because I was just going to segue into that. <laughs> Picking my brain, man. I love it. Um, anyway, Barbara, I would love to hear yeah a little bit more about each of the different organizations, their websites. Because Bob's absolutely right. We really do need to have a support mechanism out there. And this show and this information on this show is going to give people a place to go, a place to start to, if nothing else, is to share their experience or to read and learn about other people so that they can feel confident mm -hmm. and know that they're safe in sharing whatever's going on with them. I, I can't tell you through the years how many sessions I've done with people that they, they've they had these kinds of experiences and they can't tell anyone. Um, you know, they might live in a rural community, I mean very rural, and you know, they may may have a spouse that doesn't, you know, ascribe to any of this, and so they have no one to talk to. And so these websites are so vitally important for at least if nothing else, for them to feel okay about their own experiences and and maybe even get where they can write about it themselves even if you know even if they don't want to share their name I think you said they can be done anonymously right. that kind of thing right. so please go forward that's just wonderful sure um, well going back to Ender the near, near death research foundation which I mentioned um, why I think that's such a good resource because not only, like I said, do they have chat rooms and, and information and, and resources for those who have experienced near death, Jody Long, who is Jeffrey Long's wife, has uh, also, in the, probably in the last year or two, started uh, the After Death Communication Foundation. So anyone, for example, the, the example I gave with my my dear grandmother who passed, anyone who was at a um, communication of any type with anyone who's passed over, spiritual beings, etc. Wonderful uh, website for that. Uh, and she also has an out of body experience as well. Again, she's lovely to talk to. She will happily answer any email that anyone sends or direct you to resources or. Uh, a source of support and again they have chat rooms um, for for each of these areas if you've experienced a near death uh, as well there's another wonderful wonderful I can't stress this enough it's called IONS it's the International Association for Near Death Studies it's international um, and they're unique because they have actual live real support groups throughout the world. They have them on college campuses. They have them in cities throughout the United States. There are two located in Connecticut. Almost every state has at least one. You can go on their website, click under support, and then a little map of the United States will come up or wherever you're located internationally as well. You click on either the country or the state you're located in and it shows you, gives you the addresses and phone numbers and contacts of those support groups. So that wow. is for, yeah, it's wonderful. And, and I haven't actually been to one myself. The closest one is an hour and a half away. But I hear wonderful, wonderful, great things about them. I am on the board of the Past Life Research Institute, the PLRinstitute.org. They're based in Huntington Beach, California. And um, actually, my dissertation mentor is Heather uh, Rivera. She is the co-founder of the institute with her husband, Mark, who's a physicist and scientist. And that's how I got to be on the board. Heather and I became friendly during, uh, you know, the writing of my dissertation. She was an absolute wonderful mentor, and um, we we really clicked. And she invited me to become the first near death researcher on the team. The rest of the team being comprised of past life researchers and past life regressionists. 
and I flew out to California in September and presented at their annual conference. That was a lot of fun and really exciting. And they are uh, fantastic, approachable, real, kind people. And and anybody who has had a past life experience um, wants to feel safe in discussing it or wants to take part in research may do so because they have a, an ongoing uh, research study currently too. Again, anonymous. Um, and what they study are the healing benefits of uh, past life uh, mm. regression. Yeah. And I do want to point out that um, one of the board members um, named Daryl, I can give you more information or I can give it to Rebecca, he specializes in regressing people who have had near-death experiences. He helps them integrate it through it more quickly, be able to accept it more readily, and then move forward. I would think these are, and then also as as I did myself, it's it's there are so many great um, Facebook pages, uh, Facebook sites where you can literally type in any any um anything you know if you're looking for a uh, near death Facebook page, a uh, spiritual Facebook page, um, uh, anything. There are great Facebook pages. A lot of them are are closed, so they interview you first. Make sure you know they—they they don't take everybody. Um, they're very serious with serious intention and give a lot of support. Oh man! Wow, um, that's just a ton of information. That's just off the top of my head. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. I mean, I, I have more, but it, it's too long for 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 right now. So I'll be well, happy to provide them. Yeah, and you know what? Here's what I will do. Again, I will put those links on my website under the broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, the current broadcast. If there's additional links, Barbara, that you would like me to add to it sure. or contact people, email me and I will mm -hmm. update that in, in a couple of days uh, so people can sure. find that. And if you would like anybody to contact you or anybody else, I would certainly be happy to post that as well. And you can certainly have me take it down if you need me to at any time in the future. So I, w I will um, offer that up. Um, and uh, Bob, before we go tonight, um, any last final words or information that you would like to share with the audience uh, before we let you go this evening? We're about three minutes out. Um, if if anybody has um, had, anybody has had a unique encounter with a non-human intelligent entity, or just a plain old an identified flying object of some way, shape, or form, and, and they wish to provide some answers uh, to questions about that unique experience, they can go to experiencer.org and take a survey and, and provide us with that anonymous information that we will compile and analyze and uh, formulate some conclusions about. Uh, and we're very excited again about that type of feedback, and, and uh, we'd be very grateful if anybody would uh, be willing to share their, their those types of experiences on that website with us. Great, and of course I'm going to have you all of you back again, uh, uh, hopefully sometime early next year when you get some more information. We'll we'll do another little roundtable here. Barbara, anything else that you would like to leave the audience with before I let you guys go tonight? Yeah, um, I would just like to emphasize that I, I know, as Rebecca said, how important it is to to be able to share something and and feel that it is um, empathetic to and not discounted. And if anybody, I am here for any questions or, or if you'd like to contact me, please feel free to do so. Support is, is just... So very, very, very important and uh, can't be underestimated. And how would you like people to get a hold of you, Barbara? Uh, I'd be happy to give them um, my uh, email address, uh, if that's that's okay. Um, sure. I can reiterate you can either, it. Yeah, you can either do that on the air or I can post to the site, whichever one feels comfortable to you. Oh, I'll, I can give it, and then again, if you want to, it's my name, Barbara Mango, at SBC, like Sugar Baker Charlie, dot net. 
I'm always online. I, I, I go through email constantly, so you know I'll get back to you very quickly. That would probably be the Perfect. easiest way right now. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, that's it's really very, very generous of you to offer up your email like that for people if they if they have questions or uh, would like some additional information or answers or what have you. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you both for being here. And again, I invite you all to the website, uh, journeyswithrebecca.com. This information on these uh, organizations and their direct links will be posted on my broadcast site, on the page rather, uh, in the bottom uh, below the uh, current and um, new guest list. It's I, it's never really long, so it's not like you have to scroll down a long way. So that will be available um, to everyone, and I will leave that information up there until, at some time, you decide you would like me to take it down. But we will be having both uh, Barbara and Bob back. Uh, we're going to continue this discussion. We're going to take some different veins in it. We're going to expound on it, expand on it, because these are topics that are very near and dear to me. And I think the more that we can um, extrapolate information from uh, not only each other but from our own selves and the more we can be communicative about it and you know articulate the information to people I think the more we will have people coming out and science is going to have to listen they're just going to have to listen that's all there is to it so I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and I wish each and every one of you the, the best night you can possibly have I will be back here next Tuesday from 2 to 3 p.m. Central Time uh, I have a great guest list do check it out on the broadcast uh, tab so until we meet again where will your life's journey lead you many blessings everyone and good night good night mm -hmm.